there, welcome back to Coach Hall Writes. I was inspired to make this video because many of my own students are taking the ACT on this upcoming Saturday, and I wanted to remind them of some of the things we've been talking about in class, specifically for the ACT English section. So one of the things that you might have noticed if you've taken a practice ACT is that there are several questions that deal with punctuation. In this video, we're going to be talking about the different types of punctuation questions that you might encounter. I'm gonna go over the ones that we see most often. That way you know what to expect and how to answer those questions on the ACT. Out of all the different types of punctuation, I would say that commas are the most highly tested probably because there are several different ways that you can use a comma correctly. Now, I've narrowed it down to four things that I think you need to know, but it's important to recognize that these are not the only ways that you can use a comma. These are just the ways that we see most often on the ACT. On the ACT, they use what we call the Oxford comma. You can see in the example sentence there that I circled it. Basically, that means that when you're listing different things, we wanna make sure that the last thing before the conjunction, in this case, and has a comma. Now, we're not talking about parallel structure in this particular video because that's not a punctuation skill, but you'll notice that I did underline those verbs. So here's a bonus tip for you. When we list things, we wanna keep them in parallel structure. That means that if we're listing verbs, we want them to all be in the same tense like you see here. You are likely going to encounter multiple questions that assess commas after introductory clauses. Most introductory clauses start with words such as although, at, before, during, in, since, when, etc. So those are words that when you see those words at the beginning of a sentence, you know that a comma has to be coming. All of those words that I listed there were what we call subordinating conjunctions. When we have a subordinating conjunction at the beginning of a sentence, it creates a dependent clause. We need to put a comma after that clause to join it to an independent clause, which is a complete sentence. So a dependent clause is a fragment. It cannot stand on its own. Here's a quick practice question for you. It says, at Lady Liberty's foot, there is a shackle and broken chain indicating the abolition of slavery. If you wanna to try to answer this question on your own, hit pause now, otherwise just let the video play through. If you answered B, congratulations, you got it right. Now here's the thing, we just talked about commas after introductory clauses, so that might have led you to the right answer. But just remember, words like at, at the beginning of a sentence, indicate that there's a dependent clause. So in this case, we need a comma. We don't need dashes, we don't need a semicolon, but we do need some punctuation there. So B is the best answer. You're also going to see commas being used to offset extra information. When you put information in between a pair of commas, it means that that information can be removed from the sentence and the sentence should still make sense. Something else you want to remember is that commas can also be used to offset extra information. So basically what you need to remember is that if you see a pair of commas offsetting information in the middle of a sentence, it means that if the commas are being used correctly, you should be able to take the portion in between the commas out of the sentence and the sentence should still make sense. If you can't do that, then those commas are not being used correctly. Something else that you're going to want to remember is that names are essential and titles are not. So we typically do not put someone's name in between commas because we don't want to remove a name from the sentence. So let's look at what that might look like. So you can see in that first sentence there, it says, Smith, a professor at Kent College, works three days per week. So in this case, I could take out a professor at Kent College and I could just say, Smith works three days per week and that makes grammatical sense. Now, if I have that same sentence and I don't put the commas in, it's a lot harder to read, as you can see with the sentence that's beneath it where it says incorrect. You can also put the title, in this case, a professor at Kent College in the beginning before the word Smith. So you can see that in this case, we put a comma there, but the sentence remains the same. Smith works three days per week. Now look at the final sentence on the slide. That one has a comma after the word Smith. That would indicate that I could take the word Smith out of the sentence, but in this case, it would read, a professor at Kent College works three days per week. Now you might be thinking, okay, but that does make sense. And you're right, it does. 
but it's not specific enough. We want to keep his name in there. So therefore, we don't want to put a comma around Smith at the end. We still need that first comma though, but we don't want to offset Smith with two commas in that last sentence. Here's another example of how to offset extra information. So in this sentence, it says, Stobie's, a restaurant on Conway, is famous for its cheese dip. Now, as a bonus tip here, notice that it says it's I-T-S, that's possessive. I-T apostrophe S means it is. You might actually see that on the ACT because it's is a commonly confused word. In looking at the sentence, you might notice that you could actually offset that information other ways as well. For instance, you could put a restaurant in Conway in parentheses, or you could use dashes to offset that information. One thing to remember though, is that we don't mix and match punctuation when we are offsetting extra information. This is one way where the ACT might try to trick you. So if you see information being offset, we wanna make sure that we choose the answer choice with either a pair of parentheses, a pair of commas, or a pair of dashes. If it's a comma and a dash, or a dash and a comma, that's not the right answer. You can also offset a single word. Now, one word that they typically offset is the word however. Now, there are a couple different ways that we could use the word however, so we want to be careful and really think about how the word is being used in a sentence. So look at that first example there. It says, Katie did not want to go to the football game. However, Jack really wanted to attend. In this case, the word however is at the start of an independent clause. It's being used as a transition word to show contrast between the fact that Katie didn't want to go and Jack did. In this case, we do put a comma after the word however because it's an introductory word that's transitioning into that sentence. Now look at the second sentence on the slide. In this case, the word however is actually interrupting the sentence. So it says Katie did not want to go to the football game. Jack, however, really wanted to attend. So in this case, the word however is interrupting our subject and our verb. Now we need to make it grammatically correct. So we put a comma on either side of however. If you encounter a question on the ACT that has the word however underlined, double check and ask yourself, is it at the start of a complete thought or is it interrupting a complete thought? That will help you determine how to punctuate it. I said earlier that we cannot mix and match punctuation. So I wanted to give you an example of what that could look like on the ACT so you know what to avoid. This is the same exact sentence as before. Now notice in the original sentence, up at the top it says Stobies, and then you have a dash, a restaurant in Conway, comma, is. Okay, so we can't mix and match dashes and commas. So that should tell you immediately that no change is wrong. In the same regard, we can't do it the other way either. We can't have a comma and then dashes, so B is also wrong. That's not gonna be the right answer, so just know that you can cross that out on the ACT. We can't have a comma and a dash or a dash and a comma to try to offset extra info. C is gonna be wrong because there's no punctuation whatsoever. It makes it harder to read. Therefore, we're left with D. It's also important to remember that there will only be one grammatically correct answer. They're not going to give you an answer choice that has two commas and another with two dashes that are used correctly. There might be one small change between those two and you gotta sometimes really look closely at the answers, but there's always only one grammatically correct answer. Out of all the comma rules, I think this one is the hardest, but once you master it, it makes taking the ACT that much easier. If you've heard of the term fanboys, then you've probably heard of coordinating conjunctions. You just might not have known that's what they were called. The acronym fanboys stands for for and nor, but or yet so. So remember that because anytime you see one of those words, you wanna slow down and figure out what exactly is happening in the sentence because that will help you know how to punctuate. Most people try to put a comma before the word but or and just because. And some of the time that's the correct way to do it, but it's not always correct. So let's talk about the difference. If you are using a coordinating conjunction to join two complete sentences, so two independent clauses, then you do need a comma before the fanboy. However, if you're using a coordinating conjunction that is not joining two independent clauses, then you do not need a comma before the fanboy. Let's look at what this could look like. So in that top sentence there, it says, I knew it was going to rain today, but I forgot my umbrella. That has two complete sentences there. 
I knew it was going to rain today is a complete thought. I forgot my umbrella is also a complete thought. Therefore, if I want to join them with the word but, which is a coordinating conjunction or one of the fanboys, I need a comma. If I didn't have that comma there, like in the second sentence, it would be incorrect. Now look at that third sentence. What do you notice? It says, I knew it was going to rain today, but forgot my umbrella. That's the exact same as the top sentence, except there's one major difference. It doesn't say, but I forgot my umbrella. In this case, the I is implied. But because we don't have a second subject, we don't have two complete sentences because forgot my umbrella is not really working as a complete sentence here. So in this case, we would not put a comma before the word but. It would be incorrect to do so. Let's try this practice question. Bryson ran his fastest time to date, yet he did not win the race. So if I was taking the ACT and I saw a sentence like this, I would stop myself and say, you know what, yet is one of the fanboys. So let me ask myself if I have an independent clause or a complete sentence on either side. Bryson ran his fastest time to date is a complete thought. He did not win the race is also a complete thought. Therefore, I know that I need a sentence that has a comma and a coordinating conjunction if I'm going to keep it structured like this. So let's go through our answers. A is not right because it doesn't have the comma. Now B has a comma, so that looks like it's good. C has the comma, but it takes out the word he. If we do that, there's not a second independent clause. So C can't be the right answer. D also has one of the fanboys and but and yet can be used relatively similarly. So the word but could be used in the sentence. However, since it has the word he after it, we have two complete sentences and we can't use the word but in this case without a comma and that's not the answer choice. Therefore, B is the only one that's grammatically correct. Instead of using a comma and a coordinating conjunction, sometimes the ACT will throw in a semicolon. A semicolon joins two related independent clauses. So here's an example. I knew it was going to rain, however, I forgot my umbrella. In this case, I knew it was going to rain is a complete thought. However, I forgot my umbrella is also a complete thought. In this particular sentence, however is not being used to interrupt the sentence like it was in that previous sentence with Jack. So in this one, I can't do comma, however, comma, because I have two complete sentences and we can't join complete sentences with a comma. That's called a comma splice. In this case, I need a semicolon the word however, and then the comma. The most common way semicolons are used on the ACT is to join two independent clauses. So if it's not a complete sentence on either side, then you don't need a semicolon. However, there is one really rare occurrence that I honestly don't think you'll encounter because I've only seen it once on a practice test. However, it's worth mentioning just in case. And that is that if you have a very long and involved list, you can actually use semicolons to separate the items in the list. Now let's talk about dashes. There are two ways that dashes are used on the ACT. The first way is to add information to a sentence, kind of like you see in that first sentence on the slide there. The second way is to offset information within a sentence. So this is like what we talked about before with a pair of commas, you could also use a pair of dashes. We just got to remember that whatever goes in between the dashes, if it's interrupting the sentence, should be able to be removed and the rest of the sentence should be able to make sense. So you would literally read the sentence as if whatever is between the dashes isn't there. If it makes sense, then the dashes are being used correctly. Now let's talk about the other way to use a dash. If you're adding information to a sentence and you want to use a dash, there must be an independent clause or a complete sentence before the dash. The added information must be relevant to the sentence. So it could either define something, clarify it, qualify it, or extend it, but it needs to be relevant. If you see a dash being used in a sentence and it's just one dash, not a pair of dashes, read what comes before the dash. Is it a complete sentence? If yes, chances are the dash is being used correctly. If not, chances are you probably need a comma instead of a dash. When I ask my students, how do you use a colon? They usually tell me to introduce a list. Now that's not wrong, but it's also not always right. So let's talk about how we use colons grammatically 
for the ACT. So in some sense, colons are like dashes because they can be used to lead into extra information like a definition, a clarification, a qualification, or some kind of extended info. And also like dashes, there must be a complete sentence before the colon. So if you see a colon, read what comes before it and ask yourself, is it a complete thought? Because if it's not, then the colon's not being used correctly. Now, as far as what comes after the colon, it can be as small as one word, or it can be lengthier. Now, colons can be used to introduce a list, but what comes before that colon still has to be a complete thought. We can't just use a colon because we have a list. Let me show you what I mean by that. The first sentence is using the colon correctly because it says, my shopping list is very short. Now, I could end the sentence there and it would make sense, but instead, the colon's being used to offset the extra info there to basically say what the short shopping list is. In this case, eggs, bread, and milk. So we know the colon's being used correctly because the extra info is related to the beginning of the sentence and that first part there before the colon can stand alone. The second example is incorrect because my shopping list is, is not a complete sentence. To write this correctly, we would actually need to take out the colon there. It doesn't belong. Now notice this list has commas after eggs and bread. So we are using that Oxford comma like we talked about. I said previously that when you have a colon, you can have one word after the colon or it can be something longer. So in this case, that third sentence there has just one word after the colon. There was one major difference, snow. In this case, the colon is helping to emphasize that one major difference snow, but the colon's being used correctly because there was one major difference is a complete thought. Now, if I flipped the sentence and said the major difference was snow, the major difference was is not a complete thought. Therefore, we should not put a colon after the word was. 